Now it's time for our last presenter, Brother Mark Charles. So how do you follow up some of the realities that Heather was reminding us about with mass incarceration? I'm kind of sitting here like, whew, that was heavy. Um, so my brother, I see why we're in that order. Truth and reconciliation. Thank God we have some reconciliation, amen. <laughs> so let me tell you a little bit about Brother Mark Charles. Mark Charles is a speaker, writer, and consultant from Fort Defiance, Arizona, located on the Navajo Reservation. He is the son of an American woman of Dutch heritage and a Navajo man. Mark seeks to understand the complexities of American history regarding race, culture, and faith in order to help forge a path of healing and reconciliation for the nation. He's the founder of Small Loaves, an organization that um, pursues racial reconciliation through honest education, intentional conversation, and meaningful action. Mark also consults as a resource development specialist for indigenous worship through Calvin Institute of Christian Worship, serves as a national board member for the Christian Community Development Association, sound familiar? and is a member of the Board of Trustees of the Christian Reform Church of North America. So Mark is no stranger to CCDA. So can you please do me a favor of giving a warm CCDA welcome to our friend, Brother Mark Charles. Thank you. Yat A. Mark Charles Yinisha. Sin Bakade in Anna Schlin, the Tohiglin Bashachin. Sin Bakade in Abashache, the Totachini Bashanella. My name is Mark Charles, and uh, in the Navajo culture, when you introduce yourself, you always introduce your four clans. So, as was announced, my mother is American of Dutch heritage, and so um, I say Sin Bakade in which literally means the wooden shoe people. My father's mother, my second clan, is from the Tohiglini, which is the waters that flow together. My mother's father, my third clan, is also at Sinbuke Dene'a. And my father's father, my fourth clan, is Totichitni, which is the Bitterwater clan, one of the original clans of the Navajo people. I have 25 minutes um, in Navajo time <laughs> to talk to you about truth and reconciliation and the racist momentum of Christendom. I have to warn you, in the next 25 minutes, I am going to dismantle 15 years of your education. You are going to be angry. You are going to be upset. You are going to be defensive. And I can't do anything to help that. But I want to let you know that as we go through these emotions, as we go through these feelings, I'm not going to leave you there. So I. I welcome you, I invite you, I exhort you to stick with me through the end, because I believe there's something God has for us as we go through this. But we have to go through this. We have to understand this history. So I want to give you a brief history of Christendom. In the first and third centuries, we had empire and we had church. They were completely opposite to each other. Empire persecuted the church. When you became a member of the church, you did so knowing that the empire was out to get you. So you converted and you joined the church knowing that there was going to be a cost of your life in the empire as you joined the church. In the 4th century, the Roman Emperor Constantine becomes a Christian and Christianizes Rome. Now things change. Now your membership in the church is no longer dependent on your conversion or your baptism. Now it's dependent upon your citizenship in the empire. Once you have a Christian empire, you can't just go to war willy-nilly because you're Christians, right? So Augustine in the 5th century begins to develop a just war theory. Why can a Christian empire go to war? When can we go to war? In the 11th century, we have the Crusades, which is Christendom, Christian empires going out to war. In the 13th century, 
we have the church beginning to define a category of infidels, those who worshipped other gods. Primarily, these were indigenous peoples and the Muslim Moors. This is a huge shift, because with this shift, now wars are justifiable based on theological grounds. There's a little bit of momentum beginning to take place. These words were written down, invade, search out, capture, vanquish, and subdue all Saracens and pagans whatsoever, and other enemies of Christ wheresoever placed, and the kingdoms, dukedoms, principalities, dominions, possessions, and all movable and immovable goods whatsoever held and possessed by them, and to reduce their persons to perpetual slavery, and to apply and appropriate to himself and his successors the kingdoms, dukedoms, counties, principalities, dominions, possessions, and goods, and to convert them to his and their use and profit. Anyone know what this is? It's not a nicest propaganda thing I pulled off the internet last night. These are the words of Pope Nicholas V in a papal bull written in the 1452. In the 1450s, we begin to have a series of papal bulls that is the church in Europe saying to the nations of Europe, wherever you go, whatever lands you find not ruled by Christian rulers, infidels, those people are less than human and the land is yours for the taking. It was this doctrine of discovery that allowed the nations of Europe to go out to Africa, colonize the African nation, our African continent, and enslave the African people. It was also this doctrine of discovery that allowed Christopher Columbus to get lost at sea, land in a new world inhabited by millions, and claim to have discovered it. Because his doctrine told him this land was empty. In 1630... A sermon was preached. Beloved, now set, before us, now set before us life and good, death and evil, in that we are commanded this day to love the Lord our God and to love one another, to walk in his ways and to keep his commandments and his ordinances and his laws and the articles of our covenant with him, that we may live and be multiplied and that the Lord our God may bless us in the land, whether we go out to possess it. But if our hearts shall turn away so that we will not obey, but shall be seduced and worship other gods, our pleasures and profits, and serve them, it is propounded on us this day. We shall surely perish out of the good land whether we pass over this vast sea to possess it. This was John Winthrop in 1630 preaching his city on a hill sermon. This city on a hill, these colonies that were blessed by God, placed in a new land to go out and possess it. These empty lands where nobody was. This is the Protestant church, which formerly had rejected the doctrine of discovery. This is it internalizing it, adopting it, and making it their own. The momentum begins to grow. This clicker really does not work. <laughs> in 1763, King George drew a line down the Appalachian Mountains. And he essentially said to the colonies, you no longer have the right of discovery of all land west of Appalachia. This upset the colonies. They wanted to claim, to buy, to purchase, to take those empty Indian lands west of Appalachia. So a few years later, they wrote down a letter of protest. And in that protest, they said he has endeavored to prevent the populations of these states for that purpose, obstructing the laws for naturalization of foreigners, refusing to pass others to encourage their migrations hither, and raising the conditions of new appropriations of lands. They went on in that same letter to say he has excited domestic insurrections amongst us. He has endeavored to bring on the inhabitants of our frontiers the merciless Indian savages whose known rule of warfare is an undistinguished destruction of all ages, sexes, and conditions. 
Anyone ever heard of this letter? Anyone recognize it? It was signed on July 4th, 1776. And it said, we hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights. Among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. How could they say that and in the same letter? Lament the fact that they cannot discover the empty lands west of them and call Native Americans merciless Indian savages. How can the two coexist in the same letter? It's simple. Native Americans are not human. All men can be created equal if we're not men. The momentum continues to grow. A few years later, this was written down. Represent, representatives and direct taxes shall be apportioned among the several states which may be included within this union according to their respective numbers, which shall be determined by adding to the whole numbers of free persons, including those bound to service for a term of years, and excluding Indians not taxed, and three-fifths of all other persons. Do you recognize this document? Article 1, Section 2, Constitution of the United States of America. African slaves count as three-fifths of a person. Native Americans are not included. But wait, you might say, wasn't there an amendment later? Yes, there was, the 14th Amendment. It extended the rights given in the Bill of Rights to African slaves. But in 1973, that amendment was reinterpreted. And it was reinterpreted to say, but now unborn fetuses aren't human, and we can abort them. The Constitution doesn't have a foundational value for life. It is a document that has exploitation and profit at its foundation and by a popular vote or by a reinterpretation, as a nation, we can decide who is and who is not human. The momentum continues to grow. Later, these words were written down. As they, European colonizing nations, were in pursuance of nearly the same object, it was necessary in order to avoid conflicting settlements and consequent war with each other to establish a principle which all should acknowledge as the law by which the right of acquisition, which they all asserted, should be regulated as between themselves. This principle was that discovery gave title to the governments by whose subject or by whose authority it was made against all other European governments, which might be consummated by possession. You know where this was written down at? This was 1823, the United States Supreme Court. Johnson versus McIntosh. Two men of European descent arguing over a piece of land. One bought it from a native tribe, the other bought it from the government. They wanted to know who owned it. In reviewing the case, the Supreme Court stated that based on the doctrine of discovery, natives only had the right of occupancy of the land, while Europeans had the right of discovery and therefore true title to the land. This established a Supreme Court case precedent upon which nearly every land title in the nation is based. It was reaffirmed by the court in a footnote in 2005. that those tribes cannot exist surrounded by our settlements and in continual contact with our citizens is certain. They have neither the intelligence, the industry, the moral habits, nor the desire of improvement which are essential to any favorable change in their condition, established in the midst of another and superior race and without appreciating the cause 
of their inferiority are seeking to control them, we must necessarily yield to the force of circumstances and ere long disappear. Andrew Jackson, in his fifth annual message to Congress, December 3, 1833. In 1830, you can feel the momentum growing, right? In 1830, we, our Congress passed the Indian Removal Act, which allowed the settlers to move into lands further west and allowed the Congress to negotiate treaties and remove and even forcibly remove tribes to lands further west. In 1838, this allowed them to have the Trail of Tears for the Cherokee and the Long Walk for the Navajo. Throughout these years, many nations, including the Chickasaw, the Shawnee, the Lenape, the Osage, the Kickapoo, the Choctaw, the Seminole, the Creek, the Saw, the Fox, and Dakota, all experienced forced relocations. In 1862, there was a war between the Dakota and settlers and the army in Minnesota. The settlers had been encroaching and coming onto the land in Minnesota, and the, the U.S. Army and government had been making more and more treaties with the Dakota people and moving them onto smaller and smaller plots of land, but they were not fulfilling the obligations of these trees, and they were um, not providing the food, they were not providing the payments that they had provided. So in August of 1862, a few Dakota warriors went out looking for food, and they came across a farm, and they took some eggs from some white settlers, and then they killed them. And a few of these warriors went back and declared war on the settlers, and there was a six-month war between 1862 and August and December. At the end of the war, 300 or several hundred Dakota warriors went and surrendered to the army, while the others who were more aggressive fled north up into Canada and northern Minnesota. Of the few hundred that surrendered, they were taken captive, went through a trial lasting minutes, and 303 of them were sentenced to be executed. A letter was written protesting their execution saying that there was legitimate cause for them being at war because the treaties had not been held up. And this order was given. Let it be ordered that the Indians of the half-breed sentenced to be hanged by the military commission composed of Colonel Crooks, Lieutenant Colonel Marshall, Captain Grant, Captain Bailey, and Lieutenant Olin, and lately sitting in Minnesota, you caused to be executed on Friday, the 19th day of December, instant the, number, the, num the following names to wit. Cases 2, 4, 5, 6, 10, 11, 12, 14, 15, 19, 22, 24, 35, 67, 68, 69, 70, 96, 115, 121, 138, 155, 170, 175, 178, 210, 225, 254, 264, 279, 318, 327, 333, 342, 359, 373, 377, 382, and 383. This didn't make the movie. It's known as the Dakota 38. They were hung the day after Christmas, 1862. Hundreds of people lined up to watch them hang. It's said that many of them were baptized Christians of the ones who were hung, and they were singing a hymn as they died. The momentum's growing. November 29, 1864, we had the Sand Creek Massacre. We had nearly 200 peaceful Cheyenne and Arapaho men, women, and children were were settled over a hill, and an army came over. These men and women and children were waving a white flag and an American flag to show that they were there peacefully, and they were massacred. In the New York Times at the 150th anniversary just a few months ago, this was written. In terms of pure horror, few events matched Sand Creek. Pregnant women were murdered and scalped, genitalia were paraded as trophies, and scores of wanton acts of violence characterized the accounts of the few army officers who dared to report them. In 
1879, the boarding schools started. The boarding schools was an idea of the federal government, but it was implemented by many Christian churches and denominations throughout the country, including the Christian Reformed Church. Rehoboth Christian School near Gallup, New Mexico, was a boarding school until the 1970s. The mentality behind the boarding schools was this, as quoted by Richard Henry Pratt. A great general has said that the only good Indian is a dead one. In a sense, I agree with the sentiment, but only in this, that all the Indian there is in the race should be dead. Kill the Indian in him and save the man. Children were taken forcibly, sometimes from their homes. They were raised in military-type boarding schools. They were punished for speaking their languages. They were punished for practicing their culture. Many acts of abuse, sexual, physical, verbal, emotional, took place within these boarding schools. I was just up in Minnesota on the Fond du Lac Reservation. There's a beautiful lake in the middle of the Fond du Lac Reservation. I think they have so many lakes there, they just called this one Big Lake. And it's right in the middle of their reservation. And there's, on one side of the lake, there's a, a tribal center with the powwow ground, and there's another tribal campground on another part of the lake, but there's houses all around the rest of the lake. And as you walk around, you realize that all the people living in those houses are not native. But it's in the middle of the reservation. And I asked one of the elders there, I said, how come there are so many non-natives living around your lake here on your reservation? And he said, that's due to the Dawes Act. In 1887, after the federal government had moved Indian tribes west and placed them on reservations, they still wanted more land. So they wrote the Dawes Act, which allotted 160 acres of land to every native male over 18 years. The remaining land was open to white settlement. This reduced in the next 50 years native lands by two-thirds, or 156,000 square miles. And of the remaining one-third land, 25,000 of it was unfit for profitable use, being desert or semi-desert land. The Dawes Act. In 1890, we had the massacre at Wounded Knee. Lakota Chief Bigfoot and 350 followers are massacred. 20 Congressional Medals of Honor were awarded to U.S. soldiers who participated in that massacre. This massacre has been compared to the My Lai Massacre in 1968 when the Charlie Company killed between 300 and 500 unarmed men, women, and children. There have been many efforts to have these Medals of Honor rescinded, and they've all been, they've all failed. The momentum continues. December 19, 2009, President Obama signed House Resolution 3326, the 2010 Department of Defense Appropriations Act, a 67-page bill laying out the appropriations for the DOD for 2010. On page 45 in subsection 8113 is the title, Apology to Native Peoples of the United States. What follows is a seven bullet point apology. It mentions no specific tribe, no specific treaty, and no specific injustice. It basically says you had some nice land, our citizens didn't take it very politely, can't we all just get along and call this our land? And it ends with a disclaimer, saying nothing in here is legally binding. This apology was never announced, never publicized, and never read by the White House or by Congress. These words were spoken because America and Israel, we share a common destiny, the destiny of promised lands that cherish freedom and offer hope. Anyone know who said this? Any idea? It was last Tuesday in front of a joint session of Congress. Benjamin Netanyahu, the Israeli Prime Minister, spoke this to our Congress, to applause. The 
there is so much momentum going on right now. Thousands of years of momentum, of racism coming from a Christendom, coming from a belief that we have a Christian empire, that this is our promised land. What do we do with this? What do we do with this history? What's our response supposed to be? Well, if we look biblically, there's a very good biblical response that any Christian should have when confronted with this type of systemic racism and injustice and sin, and that is the call to lament. The church needs to lament. We need to lament the sins of our nation. We need to lament the sins of our church. We need to lament the sins of our ancestors. We need to lament the systemically racist system that we have built and that exists all around us. But that is an incredibly challenging thing to say to most American Christians. Why is that? How do you hear this next statement? You might want to throw this away next time. The United States of America is a pagan nation that does not have a land covenant with God. I shared this the other day in a Christian setting, and I was told that offends me. I said, good, it's supposed to. (laughs) When we think of lament, when you're going to truly lament something, you need a light at the end of the tunnel, don't you? You need some kind of hope that there's something better down the road. So often when we lament, especially when we lament the sins of our nations, what do we think? If my people will humble themselves and confess their sin and call out my name and repent of their ways, what will I do? I will heal your land. If your child stole a bike, and came to you and said, Dad, Mom, I stole this bike. Would you let him keep it? Would you paint it for him? Would you fix the flat tire? Or would you say, Son, we have to take that back? So how do you lament the sins of a nation that does not have a covenant with God? What's your hope at the end of the tunnel? What are you looking for? What's your light? We do not have a land covenant with God. If we're going to confess these sins, we need some kind of hope. Where do we get that hope? That hope does not come from Old Testament Israel. That hope comes from God's interaction with the other pagan nations throughout history. That hope comes from God's willingness to negotiate with Abraham over Sodom and Gomorrah. That hope comes from God pulling Rahab out of Jericho before he destroys the city. That hope comes from God out of his own free will saying to Jonah, go to Nineveh, I want to have mercy on those people. Our hope as a pagan nation that does not have a land covenant with God, our hope is not in any specific promise of God. Our hope is in the character of God. And I love how C.S. Lewis put it. When the children are in Narnia and they're seeing the winter and they've met the white witch and they're hearing about this character Aslan who's going to come and set things right and they've met the beavers and they're having dinner with the beavers in their house and they're starting to ask questions about Aslan and it starts to dawn on them that Aslan might not be a man and finally Susan says, um, excuse me, is Aslan a man? And Mrs. Beaver says, ha, no, honey, he's a lion. And she says, oh my goodness, I will feel quite nervous about meeting a lion. Well, you should. (laughs) If anyone can stand before Aslan without their knees knocking, they're either braver than most or just plain silly. 
And then Susan says, is he safe? No, he's not safe. He's a lion. (laughs) But he's good. He's good. Our only hope as a pagan nation that does not have a land covenant with God is that whatever he decides to do with our lament, it's good. It's good. We have to go back to that. We have to go back to that. Many nations around the country, around the world, have had what they call truth and reconciliation commissions. Canada just had one a few years ago where they, they dealt with the, the history of their boarding schools and they had a truth and reconciliation commission where they went around and taught the history of residential schools and allowed the, the survivors to share their stories. And then they, um, they uh, had members of the church and the government there to receive those stories and to offer commitments of reconciliation. That came out of a lawsuit brought by the boarding school survivors against the government. And it was a settlement. And out of that settlement, $60 million was set aside to have this Truth and Reconciliation Commission. There was something very similar that happened in South Africa and in a few other nations around the world. But after my experience in the United States, I've realized we cannot have a Truth and Reconciliation Commission. Because in order to have reconciliation, you have to have repentance. And as the apology demonstrated, our nation and our churches are not ready to own their history with Native Americans. And so reconciliation is not possible. And so a few months ago, I wrote an article, and I began to ask about, what about having just a truth commission? What if we had a series of conferences, beginning with one in Washington, D.C. in December of 2016? Because I think President Obama and Pope Francis are the perfect storm of two leaders of these institutions that might just be willing to deal with the doctrine of discovery. So let's have it after the general election, but before he leaves office. (laughs) No risk whatsoever. And what if we had a truth commission and we built a platform and allowed Native American boarding school survivors and relocators to come forward and share their story? What if we had an outpouring of people from the grassroots coming forward to hear these stories and to be educated on this history and to say that we're going to make some changes? And what if at this conference we left an empty chair for President Obama, for Pope Francis, for denominational leaders? for the prime ministers of Germany and England and the Netherlands and all these other nations that discovered this land. Telling them we're going to have this dialogue with or without you, but there's an empty chair here waiting for you to join us if you would like to come and sit with us. So I'm literally traveling around the country for the next six months, laying out this vision, asking people, what do you think of this idea? of beginning to wrestle with this question of our history. This is a question that we've never wrestled with in our entire history, and I think we need to begin to deal with it. The third thing I think we should do is I want to give a vision Because when you're dealing with this depth of systemic racism, when you're dealing with this much momentum, when you're dealing with this deep of a problem, it's easy to say, well, let's just wait for God to come back. Let's just wait for Jesus to come. But I'm actually really, really scared of Jesus coming back right now. Because I've read the book of Amos. Have you read the book of Amos? Woe to you who long for the day of the Lord. Why do you long for the day of the Lord? The day will be darkness, not light. It will be as though a man fled from a lion only to meet a bear, as though he entered his house and rested his hand on the wall only to have a snake bite him. 
Will not the day of the Lord be darkness, not light, pitch dark without a ray of brightness? I hate, I despise your feasts. I hate your festivals. I can't stand your assemblies. Even though you bring me burnt offerings and grain offerings, I will not accept them. Though you bring choice fellowship offerings, I will have no regard for them. Away with the noise of your songs, I will not listen to the music of your harps. But let justice roll down like a river and righteousness like an ever-flowing stream. We have too many people, too many Christians in this nation, I believe, whose hope is found in the belief that they live in a Christian empire instead of the fact that they have a personal savior and a relationship with the creator of the world. And if Christ came back today, many of the inhabitants of our Christian empire are nowhere near ready to meet their maker. So what do we do? If the goal is not to make a Christian nation, and we also don't want to just ask God to come quicker because it will mean judgment for so many people, what do we do? I want to give you a vision, and I know I'm going over, I'm sorry for this, but I want to just lay out this vision very quickly here. When I first started talking about the issue facing Native Americans, I began to use this metaphor of a grandmother in a house. And I said to people, being Native American and living in the United States, it feels like our Native communities are this old grandmother who has this very large and very beautiful house. And years ago, some people came into our house and they locked us upstairs in the bedroom. Today, our house is full of people. They're sitting on our furniture, they're eating our food, they're having a party inside our house. They've since come upstairs and unlocked the door to our bedroom, but it's much later. We're tired, we're old, we're weak, and we're sick, so we can't or we don't come out. But the thing that hurts us the most is that virtually nobody from this party ever comes upstairs, seeks out the grandmother in the bedroom, sits down next to her on the bed, and simply says, thank you. Thank you for letting us be in your house. If Senator Brownback would have come to me seven years ago and said, I'm thinking about doing an apology, he's the one who initiated the apology. I would have said, we're not ready to do that. Why don't you start by showing some gratitude and respect towards the indigenous peoples of this land? And I wrestled for years after having that metaphor of what's the grandmother's response if people start coming up and saying thank you? And I realized our response is to use language of adoption. I often tell our native peoples, we live in a nation that desperately needs to be adopted. We have 350 million undocumented immigrants who have come from every nation under the sun. They've left their lands, they've left their homes, they've left their families, they've left everything that makes sense to them, and they've come here largely pursuing a financial dream of prosperity but they've never asked for, nor have they ever received permission to be here. And so they live here like they're living in a hotel room. As native peoples, our creation stories take place in this land. They tell us why the mountains sit where they sit, why the rivers flow where they flow. They ground us to this land and they help us to live with here respectfully. I think what we need to do as Native Americans is not to sue our uninvited guests, not to kick them out, but to adopt them, to give them space in this land, to share our stories, to share our connection to this land, and to teach them how to live well within this land. That's my vision of reconciliation. That's my vision of this nation coming together. That's my vision of our nation learning to have a little more humility and of our indigenous peoples being willing to stand up and no longer play the victim card, but instead play the host card and to welcome each and every one of you into our lands and to adopt you into our families. 
and to give you space and teach you how to live well here. Thank you very much.